Well, good morning. This is our last week in the book of Matthew. I hope you've enjoyed this series. And, uh, you know, even though we concluded Matthew with uh, the death and resurrection at Easter time, we're just going back to Matthew 24 and 25 because this is what Jesus says about the last days. This is what he says about the second coming. And since that is still our future, those days are ahead of us, I thought, that would be good for us to look at. At Easter, Jesus is raised from the dead, and it was thought that, you know, originally he was lost to us, but he returned. But Jesus says that he will return again. We read last week in Matthew 24, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so as Christians, we read these words, and that sounds a little scary because we don't know what this will look like. We don't know when this will happen, but the truth of the matter is it really doesn't matter because Jesus said it would happen. And the things that Jesus predicts come true. So regardless of what I believe or or what I'm hoping for, right? No matter what I am hoping the second coming is, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to return. So there should be still something there in chapters 24 and 25 for me, for us who live in 2022, because these chapters take place after the triumphal entry. They take place after uh, Palm Sunday. They take place after Jesus flips the temple the temple tables in the synagogue. Uh, This takes place after Jesus confronts the Pharisees. So right before the cross, right before Easter, Jesus pulls his disciples aside and talks to them about his second coming. But oh, how he wish that he had said more, right? Or more, more was recorded, more was said, because it's forced so many people to go through these verses line by line and decode uh, what Jesus is trying to say. And, and, and they try to come up with their own doomsday clock. You know, Halley's Comet passes by the earth approximately once every 76 years. But the nearness that it came to earth way back in 1910 forced a lot of people to say that that was the end, that, that we were going to be destroyed. There was even a newspaper headline that said, Comet may kill all earth say scientists. The Mayan calendar, remember that? Predicted the world would end December 21st, 2012. In the 1990 book, The New Millennium by Pat Robertson, he suggested that April 29th, 2007 would be the day that Earth would end. And then currently, Kent Hovind, uh, he's a Christian fundamentalist, evangelist, he speculates that 2028 will be the year of the rapture. You know what? None of it matters. It doesn't. The only thing that matters is what the Bible says. The only thing that matters is what Jesus says. In verse 36, he says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Have you ever wondered about that whole statement, how, how even Jesus doesn't know when he's going to return? Well, it's because no human being knows. No human being knows. And Jesus is fully human. So that is part of his unknowing. The Bible says only God knows. What does that mean? Well, it means the next book that comes out or the next prediction that's made, don't believe it. Don't buy it. This Bible says two women working in the field, 
one taken, one left. Two men grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. Which one? Right? Which one is taken? Which one is left? And what does that mean? Guess what? It doesn't matter. What we know is, on that day, your life stands alone. His coming will be sudden, and his judgment will be final. So we have to be ready. We can't think we're ready. We need to know we're ready. Jesus warns that even people who think they're prepared won't be. He says in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Did you know that there are people They go to church every Sunday, who serve on their board, serve on their nominating committee. They do everything Christian, but they're not. Going to church does not make you a Christian any more than going to the garage makes you a car. Matthew 15, 8, Jesus says, People honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So how do you know? Jesus says he's going to be returning. We have to be ready. How do you know if you're prepared? Well, Jesus is going to help you answer that. He's going to answer that in the next five stories. He's going to give you a checklist. And so we're going to sit up straight, we're going to roll up our sleeves, and we're going to do some serious examination. Matthew 24, verse 42 says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. There's your first question. Are you staying awake? Are you staying awake? 2 Peter 3 says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Revelation 3 3 says, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour that I will come against you. How do you prepare for that? How do you prepare for a thief coming in the middle of the night. I mean, if you overheard that a thief was coming tonight to your house at 2 a.m., what would you do? Would you set an alarm for 1.45? Are you ever gonna go to sleep? Not in Texas, right? So how do you stay awake as a Christian? Well, first of all, I don't really like referring to Jesus as a thief. Right? Can we, make, can we make this example maybe a little bit more palatable? I mean, less scary? Okay. How do parents look forward to the coming of their first child? With anxious excitement, right? There's, there's no, they're not going to make any far away travel plans, right? They're going to stay close to home. Phone is at the ready. Bags for the hospital are packed. They've read up right? All the books on how the best way is to prepare. You took that free preparedness class at the hospital. You've baby-proofed your entire house. The nursery is painted, car seats installed, crib is put together, and then you wait anxiously. It could happen at any moment. How do you feel? Nervous and excited, right? The baby is coming. Well, how do you look forward to Christ's return? Shouldn't it be the same? There's a lot of questions that we don't know. But what we do know is Jesus says, stay awake. He says, be prepared. He says, be ready. Are we ready? Is there more that we could be doing? It's a question that we probably have to answer for ourselves. But let's see what else he says. In verse 45, he says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master has set over his household, to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find him so doing when he he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day that he does not expect him and in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him in with the hypocrites. In that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Two different examples, same analogy, right? One is taken, one is left. Only this time, Jesus says, one is obedient. 
right? One servant remembers that the master is coming back. One servant lives their life as though the master is coming back. And the other servant seems to have forgotten that the master will ever return. So our second question is, are you obediently following Jesus? Are you obediently following Jesus? Last week, we said that you don't get a stopwatch, right? There's no stopwatch that's ticking down until Christ comes back. But just for the sake of argument, what if you did have one? What if you could watch the seconds count down? And what if the return wasn't even years or or even decades away, what if it was this weekend? What if you could look at the stopwatch and it said, Jesus is coming back this weekend. Would you decide now to live differently? Would you decide now to love differently? Most of us would say yes, but then why? Why would we live better knowing that we had so little time left? Because right now, we act like we have all the time in the world. Guess what? Jesus says, you don't. (laughs) Jesus says you don't have all the time in the world. He promises that his return will be unexpected. He promises it'll be a surprise, just like death. When you have a family member or a friend die, when death happens, it happens suddenly, it happens unexpectedly, and people say, I never got to tell them. I never got to say, if I could just have one last conversation, if I could just have one last moment, well, that time for that last moment, that last conversation is now. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Doing what? Obeying, right? Obeying. Should should I love my neighbor more now? Should I hate my own sin more? Should I forgive those who sinned against me more? Make sure that those who don't know Christ in my life get another chance. With each passing day, we lose time. There is now less time than you had before. For the Christian, we don't nod off and sleep, and we don't stop obeying. All right, we're going to go over into Matthew chapter 25, and it begins with a very popular parable. Verse 1 says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some oil for our lamps, for they are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for all of us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Again, in our parable, Jesus is speaking of his second coming, and he's speaking of our readiness for it. And he uses the symbol of a Jewish wedding. On a Jewish wedding day, the party begins at the groom's house. And then the groom and his attendants, they would go at dusk with torches to the bride's house. And people ran before him to announce his coming. And the bride and her maids would go out to meet the groom. And he would conduct them all in a big parade back to his house for the wedding feast. Jesus says in John 14, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Jesus often refers to himself as the groom. And he refers to the church as his bride. Jesus speaks love language to you. And here we have 10 bridesmaids, all 10 looking forward to the groom's return, all 10 wanting to be a part of the wedding feast, all 10 representing believers. But five did not plan ahead. Jesus says, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. 
Those, those doomsday prophets, they're crazy. Jesus isn't coming back soon. Not in my lifetime. You know, we've got plenty of time. Church, uh, today, this morning, eh, nah, let's sleep in. I, you know, I, I, served, I served the church last year. I gave to the church last year. Tithe 10% of my salary? I don't know. I mean, you said we wanted to go to Hawaii this year. Money is tight. More than once, Jesus says his return will be delayed. And that delay puts people at ease. They become ill-prepared. They become lazy. They become restless. They become selfish. What kind of things make us lazy and restless? Last week we said that darkness is coming. Antichrist is coming. Cancer is coming. Death is coming. Persecutions of Christians are coming. And Jesus says, expect it. Jesus said, expect it and persevere through all of it. He said, hang on, hold on. In verse 10, he says, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Here you have five bridesmaids who trust. They persevere through the night. They persevere through the darkness. They are prepared no matter what. They have extra flashlight batteries. They've got a first aid kit. They've got a CB radio. They've got astronaut ice cream. They've got a rain poncho. And they've got a book of crossword puzzles. They're ready. They are not going to miss the return of the bridegroom. In this parable, five bridesmaids persevere. Five hold fast. Five hang on. So it doesn't matter what happens. And it doesn't matter when it happens. Jesus says, stay awake, stay obedient, and trust that he will come back. Are you trusting Jesus? Do you live your life trusting that he will come back? Last week we read, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And again, in this example, Jesus gives us two types of people. People who trust, right? Those are the people that endure. And people who trust don't give up. They don't throw the towel in. They don't put it on autopilot. If you're a fan of the Astros, but as they lose more and more, you decide, you know what? I think I'd rather be a fan of the Rangers. And then when the Astros win the World Series, you run to your closet and grab your Astros shirt and say, I've always been a fan. No, you have not. Jesus says there are fickle fans. There's wannabes. There are people that will not endure to the end. The bridesmaids are prepared because they trust. They don't believe the rumors. They don't believe the conspiracy theories. Jesus said he's coming back, and that's the only assurance they need. So we've come to this question again, just like we did last week. What do we do in the meantime? We can't just sit around and twiddle our thumbs, right? Last week in chapter 24, Jesus said we should continue to preach the gospel. Make sure everyone has a chance to hear the good news. Now we're in chapter 25. What does he say to follow that up? In verse 14, he says, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also went to the two talents. And he came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, then you ought to have at least invested my money with bankers, and at my coming I would have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him who gave it to him and who has ten talents, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he who has will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, 
Even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who is the master in the story? Who is always the master in the story? God, right? Always God. And the master of the story has given extravagantly to his followers. Us, we have, we have blessings, right? We have blessings, yes. Blessed every day. Blessed in so many ways. And again, two different approaches to following. Those who follow will hear, well done. And those who don't follow will hear, you are a wicked and slothful servant. Why slothful? I mean, it's lazy, right? That's what he's saying. You're lazy. Jesus says the disciple risks in their life. At one point, he says that we should deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Following Jesus is risky. Discipleship involves my complete surrender. It involves giving up my time, my talent, and my treasure, all for the kingdom of God. And to surrender something is not easy. Every single one of us is going to stand before Christ, just like the rich young ruler, as someone who has owned much, been given much, and we are called to give it all away and to follow him. And we're going to want to argue with Jesus about how, you know, I gave you some, Lord. I, I gave you some. I surrendered some of my stuff. I gave you some of my talents. But did you really expect me to give all of it away? Did you really expect me to sell out completely? I'll give you some of it on Sunday. I'll give you some of my time. I'll give you some of my money. And yet, just like we saw at Easter, he surrendered all of himself for you. Are you serving Jesus with your gifts and your talents? But Lord, that's not what I had in mind when I became a Christian. I thought I'd, I thought I'd just go to church regularly, be nice to some people, help out every once in a while. I, I, I'm more of that kind of disciple. Wilbur Reese wrote a book called $3 Worth of God. He saw a person put $3 in the offering plate and he asked, doesn't that sound silly? To only ask for that much, to only want that much of God, to only expect that much of God. He said $3 worth of God doesn't involve a lot of risk. It lets me believe I've purchased enough of him just to keep me out of hell, but allows me to keep most of my life for my own use. So what do we do with these words from Jesus? In another part of Matthew, Jesus says, for whoever wants to serve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life from me will find it kind of blows that whole $3 worth of God philosophy out of the water, doesn't it? Real discipleship is risky. And the parable of the talents isn't as much about what someone does with their talents, but rather what someone is willing to risk for Jesus. God has given every single one of us a life and resources that make up that life. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. God has entrusted us with abilities, Talents, God has given us quality and quantity of life. And this parable is about our willingness to risk that stuff for him. But notice that the servants who are condemned, it wasn't for something they did. It was for something they didn't do. They did nothing. Jesus gives us so much. And our greatest joy should be to steward that blessing, to return his blessing to the world. It's not enough for us just to endure. We should be working, not to earn your keep, not to earn your salvation, but rather we serve and we give because we love. Let's go on. Let's finish this chapter. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? 
And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him, truly I say to you, as you did for the one of the least of these, you did also to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? And then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Our last question. Not only are you serving Jesus, but are you serving others with your gifts and talents? John 13 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. At our church, we say it like this. We love God and we love others. That's what Jesus teaches us to do. But notice in the parable, God does not expect the same level of risk from each of us. God does not expect us to go beyond our capacity. Some of us have a five-talent capacity. Some of us have a two-talent capacity. Some of us have a one-talent capacity. If God gave you pebbles, he doesn't necessarily need you to build him a skyscraper. But he does expect you to build. If God's given you cotton thread, he doesn't expect you to weave an Oscar ball gown but he does expect you to weave. God does expect his children to risk something. God does expect his gifts to be used. God expects us to sacrifice. You know, the word Christian is only used three times in scripture. Saying you're a Christian, it's not that scary. Because in America, it just means somebody who goes to church and maybe occasionally believes in God. But there's another word used 260 times throughout the pages of the New Testament, and that's the word disciple. It's derived from the Greek, mathetes, which means learner, which means pupil. A disciple is somebody who learns from their teacher. But Jesus expanded this meaning. According to Jesus, our mission on earth is not only to create followers, but to create followers who know and obey his teachings. And his biggest teaching was that we would love him and love our neighbor. Right before he left, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the end of the age. That is the Great Commission. That is our marching orders. Jesus said this before he left from heaven, and these were his last instructions to us. So, until we have new instructions, this is what we do. We persevere, and we eagerly await his return. Let's pray together. Lord, we all look forward to your return. We look forward to that beautiful day where you descend from the clouds. Lord, in the meantime, give each one here the strength to persevere, the wisdom to preach the gospel, the love in our hearts to love our neighbor as ourself, and give us the strength to serve each day, advancing your kingdom and making sure that all know the sweet, sweet name of Jesus. We ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. And of course, we want to invite you here to Walden Community Church. We're here uh, every Sunday. We have two services, one at 9.30 and one at 11. Our 9.30 service is our traditional service. We sing all the hymns that you remember. We have a choir. And then our 11 o'clock service is more uh, contemporary. It's more laid back. Just come, uh, come casual, come as you are. We have a worship team. And our 11 o'clock hour is also the hour where we have a full children's program and youth group. 
We also have youth group uh, going on all through the summer. So our youth group doesn't stop through the summer, it, it goes through. Uh, they got a lot of exciting things planned, going to the pool, going to some concerts, going to camp. Uh, please send your kids over on Wednesdays at six. We'll even feed them for you and we'll send them back to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys, I'll see you next week, bye.